Thank you, Fran. Thank you very much, Kira. Hello, everyone. Um, Kira, if you wouldn't mind advancing the screen to um, a couple a couple slides in. Very good. Okay, so thank you for having me. Today, we're going to talk about evidence-based programs and how your library can get involved and start offering these programs to your patrons and community members. We'll go over some of the more popular programs, why libraries make the perfect venue, some of the key exercises all older adults should do as they continue to age, the 2019 Jerry Fit study that involved 535 library patrons across the United States, how they're doing now five years later, and most importantly, funding sources that could benefit your library. But before we start, I'd like to tell you that I'm a very informal presenter. So if you have any questions during the presentation, type them in the chat box and I can either answer them as we go along or save it to the end. Next slide, please. So a little bit about myself. My name is Fran Fisher. I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio, now located in Tucson, Arizona since 2019 and I've been in the fitness industry practically my entire life. I'm a lifelong entrepreneur and an advocate of disease prevention programs for older adults. I'm also the creator of the Jerry Fit program. For the past 10 years, the Jerry Fit program has been recognized as a tier three evidence-based health promotion disease prevention program, making it the highest level of evidence-based programs available in the nation. It is one of many evidence-based programs eligible for Title III-D Older Americans Act funding through the United States Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Community Living. Jerry Fit is also an improved chronic disease self-management support program for the self-management of heart disease, diabetes prevention, and pain management programs. Currently, the Jerry Fit program is held at over 400 locations throughout the United States and abroad, including many libraries, especially rural libraries. Next slide, please. So what are evidence-based programs or EBPs as they're often called? These are programs that were developed out of need or for a special purpose like increasing balance, improving strength, managing chronic disease like diabetes or preventing diseases. These programs have been thoroughly tested and must have a proven track record and be absolutely safe. All approved programs have undergone extensive research studies to prove their effectiveness and these studies must be published in highly regarded journals. The programs also have to have a training program in place for the class leaders so that they can learn how to lead or coach a class. There also has to be materials that are ready for national dissemination and proven lesson plans so that program fidelity is carried out. Once these programs are submitted, then they are vetted by special committees who determine how they're rated. If the criteria is determined to be the highest tier level, which is three, then the program is eligible for funding under the Older, Older Americans Act, Title 3D. Some of the more popular evidence-based programs are a matter of balance, Tai Chi for arthritis, powerful tools for caregivers, walk with ease, better choices, better health, and Jerry Fit. Each program in its area of specialty is posted on the National Council on Aging's website at ncoa.org. Scroll, the, scroll to the bottom of their homepage and click on the link that says, find an evidence-based program. Then click on the read article tab to read the overviews of each of these evidence-based programs, as well as the costs, training requirements, and other associated conditions for implementation. Evidence-based programs are typically held anywhere from eight to 12 weeks long 
depending on the type of program, whether it be fall prevention, diabetes prevention, pain management, or others. Physical activity programs like GeriFit can be ongoing. This is an important factor of sustainability. Next slide, please. So libraries are a natural fit for community education programs of this nature. There, you know, fall, fall prevention is a very big thing now in libraries, as well as senior centers and congregate meal sites. They want people to learn how to fall proof their home. And look at these statistics, they're amazing. Nine million falls in the US per year, 2.5 million are seniors over the age of 65. You know, the average cost of a fall is $40,000, but some of these seniors refuse to go to a senior center. They, whatever stigma senior centers might have, older adults just won't go in there. On the other hand, libraries provide a warm and welcoming social atmosphere that makes everyone feel comfortable. If you have a meeting room and chairs and tables, you can be a hosting site for evidence-based programs. Next slide, please. So let's take fall prevention, for instance. Falls are nat not a natural part of aging and they can be prevented. Muscle wasting, a loss of flexibility and inactivity are physical factors that can be treated in order to reduce the likelihood of a fall. At least one old chronic disease afflicts every older adult age 65 and older and includes arthritis, heart disease, depression, obesity, chronic lung disease, emphysema, emphysema and asthma, cognitive impairment, strokes or dementia, hypertension, and even cancer. Next slide, please. Walking still remains the most popular form of exercise older adults can participate in, but walking alone is not going to sufficiently stress the muscles. Even if you walk three times a week, that may not be sufficient exercise. Next slide, please. It's true, only 10% of older adults participate in strength training programs and resistance training is the most important activity that needs to be done as we continue to age. The more muscle you have, the healthier you'll be. Next slide, please. So many confuse weight-bearing exercise, which is walking, with weight training, which is working out with weights, or it's more commonly referred to as resistance training. They're actually two completely different types of physical activities. So let me explain. Resistance training includes dumbbells, barbells, weight training equipment, Nautilus, and other machines where the amount of weight being used can be changed. Weight bearing exercise is constant. It's your body weight but you need both weight bearing and resistance training in order to build and retain muscle strength. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Sorry. All right, so the American College of Sports Medicine uh, maintains their position. They suggest that weight bearing activities, which is walking, be done three to five times per week and include resistance exercise, which is two to three times per week for strength training. In addition, 150 minutes of physical activity is what people need to do in order to continue to live independently and perform their ADLs, which is activities of daily living. And this is regardless of any age, but particularly older adults because of the natural muscle loss that occurs with aging. Frailty will lead to dependence and you won't be able to stay in your home. But if you exercise and stay healthy, you can probably live in your home forever. Next slide, please. Well, why should we be doing all this exercise and sustained activity? This is because chronic disease is rampant here in the US 
four out of five older adults over the age of 50 suffer from at least one chronic disease. Next slide, please. And just to go over these once more, what did we say they were? Diabetes, heart disease, breathing problems, arthritis, and being overweight. Just look at all these things can, that can be prevented with just a little bit of exercise. Next slide, please. So how can we turn back the hands of time? Next slide, please. Through strength training, it's a secret weapon against muscle loss. Next slide, please. Think of strength training as all prevention. Next slide, please. Strength training leads to some very good outcomes that everyone needs. It increases strength, it increases flexibility, it provides better stability and balance, which equates to fewer falls. It increases circulation, improves speed and power, enhances your ability to perform those activities of daily living, ADLs, provides a better outlook on life, puts you in a better mood, and it will definitely help manage chronic diseases such as diabetes, arthritis, heart disease, and more. And strength training is easy to do, especially in chairs. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna go over some jerry fit exercises in this next section. And these are simple yet effective strength training exercises older adults can do to stay healthy. And I'm not gonna say don't try this at home because I want you to try these at home. Next slide, please. So this first exercise is called a squat assessment. We do this at the onset of a beginning a jerry fit program at a location or facility. This is how we determine what shape somebody's in and how they're going to be able to do the jerry fit program if they're able to just budge themselves off the chair. And one of the main goals in the jerry fit program is to help older adults maintain their independence. They have to be able to stand up from a seated position or else rapid decline will occur. And I'm sure all of you have seen at one time or another the inability of an older person to get up from a seated position or a couch. They struggle. Trying to stand up from a table at a restaurant can be another embarrassing situation when someone just doesn't have the strength to budge themselves off a chair. They simply have lost muscle in the hips and glutes, which are the main muscle group and areas that Jerry Fit targets. In this beginner sample exercise, we retrain the body and reactivate those muscles that have gone dormant through lack of use. Using thumb assistance, an individual can budge themselves off a chair, even if just barely, and work to doing this 10 times, adding more sets as mobility and strength gets better. By the end of the four weeks, just eight classes, most older adults are able to stand up completely and easily without using any assistance whatsoever. Next slide, please. In time, hip and glute strength develops and most participants are able to stand up easily from the chair, regardless of their age. This exercise is called the perfect squat. So when you bend down, you want to shift the hips back, keep your knees behind the ends of the toes, as if you're going to sit in the chair, but don't rest at the bottom and stand right back up. Keep your knees positioned behind the ends of the toes, shift the hips back, 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 start with 10 squats, then increase the number of sets like 10, 10, and 10, which would be three sets of 10 reps or 30 repetitions total. And as we get really good at this exercise, we can even use a little weight held underneath the chin for added resistance. Next slide, please. And for those that have a little problem with their knees or have can't bend down, we have an alternate exercise called the double chair leg raise. This exercise works the quadriceps. You can make it easier or more challenging by the amount of pull you have on the reins. The less you pull back on the ends of the stretch band, 
the more work will be required by the quads. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorite exercises as it does help a lot with low back pain, which many of us have. You can use a kitchen counter, an island, and sandwich yourself in between, or do it using two chairs or two tables. You don't need to bend down too far either. This photo shows a half ref lunge, but at the beginning, just bend both legs just a little, just a quarter of the way down, and bend both legs simultaneously simultaneously as shown. As you build up strength over a few weeks, you can increase the range of motion to do a half rep or possibly a full rep lunge. Much later on, you can add weight to the exercise by balancing a dumbbell on the shoulder and holding onto a surface with the other hand, like a chair, counter, or table. Next slide, please. This is another simple yet highly effective exercise for improving balance. It's a regular calf raise or a releve for those of you with dance backgrounds. This ex exercise can also include some proprioceptive techniques in order to get more benefits from it. Here, fingertip contact is lessened one finger at a time, and eventually the person will not hold on to the back of the chair. However, it is suggested they keep their hands just above the chair so that they can grab onto it if needed or if the body starts to teeter. Always think safety and be within reach of a table or a surface to grab onto. Next slide, please. We include balance exercises in the Jerry Fit program for fall prevention. This is a one leg balance exercise but it also works on building ankle strength. The photos show you how to do it. So these are just a small sampling of some of the exercises that were used in the 2019 study that involved 49 small and rural libraries across the United States. We'll talk about that more next. Next slide, please. So back in 2019 and before COVID hit, Virtual programming was just beginning to take off, and our company was excited to test market our newest video version of the Jerry Fit program. Dr. Noah Lenstra of the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, who I met on a conference call with the National Institute of Aging in 2018, offered to keep track of the date data for us and to formalize it for later. These are just some of the statistics. We had 800 people sign up, and of that, 535 completed the 12-week program, and 49 libraries across the United States participated. We held class twice a week for three months from January 29 to April 2019. We'll look at some of these statistics. 73% between the ages of 65 to 80, 87% were female participants, and 12% for male participants. Next slide, please. And this is how it looked. This is a typical Jerry Fit class exercising to a video that was shown on a widescreen wide screen TV at libraries. In the study, we had three exercise videos that were ro rotated during the 12 week period. Participants attended class twice a week for 45 minutes each time and some even drove as far as 25 miles one way to take the class. The groups were extremely dedicated, and even though it was the worst recorded winner in U.S. history, they still made it to class. Next slide, please. At the end, we asked the 535 participants, also known as our completers, to fill out a survey, and these were the results. And as you can see, strength, well-being, improved balance, and the ability to stand up had gotten better for many. In fact, 78% of the participants saw an increase in strength. And the purpose and the objective of the study was to evaluate the effectiveness of using a video-led exercise in intervention in public libraries. And we did this by training the librarians um, how to rotate the videos for the 12 weeks 
And after completing the online training program, they administered the program, video-based jury fit, either in the library's meeting room or open space. But what was so remarkable about it was 92% of the served communities had populations of under 13,000, including 65% that served populations under 5,000. And the public librarians also reported strong support. 97% intended to continue offering exercise programs at their libraries. And 97% of the older adults who participated said that they would recommend Jerry Fit to a friend. Next slide, please. So the mental health impacts were even more important. They were a definite yes for many of the participants People liked the camaraderie of getting together twice a week and the social interaction it provided. It definitely had a positive effect on their behavioral health. Next slide, please. And we also had a section where the participants could write in what they saw as an improvement in their own words. And many of them noted the increased socialization, better health, strength and tone and improved mobility. So we can look at some of these. Uh, we had 327 people actually uh, write in their own words what they thought about the program. And particularly uh, 18 of those people had less pain. They were less sore, which was nice to see, better posture, more energy, better sleep, in addition to all the ones that had the stronger uh, results. Next slide, please. So these are some of the other excerpts that we also um, found. We had, I'm encouraged that I can do better and stop the downward spiral I've been in. Thanks to everyone who made this possible. They're, they were extremely appreciative that they were able to participate in this study. And um, it, they're still involved, most of them. Here's another one. It was a social time as well as physical exercise time. We all need each other as well as physical time for our bodies. Another person said, I have, I feel better, have more energy and stay motivated to exercise. So those are some of the comments that we heard. Next slide, please. But to our amazement, 85% of the study participants continued Jerry Fit after the study had concluded. They really liked it. And now, five years later, at least three Indiana libraries are still offering Jerry Fit video led classes. And we reached out to them to see how the classes were going. And here's what they said. Some of them, after having my stroke, my right side was had very little movement, but with Jerry Fit, it has helped me more than physical therapy did. We certainly liked hearing that. One lady that was 87 years old from Hope Stat Library in Indiana said, I enjoy the social hour before, during, and after. And they, they really do like to get together. It's this whole thing that if everybody has to exercise, they're doing it together. They enjoy that very much. And we do hear this one a lot, that there are 79 year old lady with lots of medical issues and have been doing Jerry Fit for a little over a year now. And it has helped her with her movement and socialization with the other ladies. So this is really very positive things. So next slide, please. So we're gonna spend a lot of time on this slide and talk about how your library can offer some of these evidence-based programs. The first thing to do is research. Determine what programs your patrons may find beneficial. Are they interested in Tai Chi classes, diabetes prevention courses, strength training and balance improvement classes, possibly fall prevention? And how can you make this determination? Well, I'd suggest start with an interest survey. Pull your patrons and ask them what they might like to see offered at your library. And the next thing you could possibly do is contact your SUA, your state unit on aging. This is the entity that receives the Title 3D Older Americans Act funding for evidence-based programs. They in turn allocate this funding to PSAs, which are planned service areas. 
These include area agencies on aging, libraries, and other county health departments. Some area agencies on aging may encompass several counties in a certain area. For instance, the state of Indiana has 16 planned service areas. And last year, the state of Indiana received more than $500,000 for preventive services funding, which include health promotion and disease prevention evidence-based programs. So ask your SUA how your library can get involved so that you can offer evidence-based programs at your library. They might suggest for you to partner with your local senior center. And many senior centers are so overbooked, they just don't have the room nor the time to offer additional programs. They seek out alternate hosting sites for EBPs. And libraries are the perfect venue because you already have the clientele. Chances are they'll welcome you with open arms and will want to partner with you and maybe even share their funding with you or possibly sub-license some of their evidence-based programs with you. Remember, the bird does not get fed unless it opens its mouth, so ask. There's alternate funding available too. If Title 3D Older, Adult Mer Older Americans Act funding has already been allocated, there's alternative funding sources that might be available, such as CARES, grants through your county health department or local hospital, the American Recovery Act funding, Friends of the Library, or even through private sources or donations. Next, your budget. Your budget must take into consideration the cost of the program license, any training costs, utility costs, staff salaries, advertising and marketing, ongoing license renewal fees, instructor costs, and room rental fees, if any. Next, set a timeline. We always suggest to work backwards from the start date. If you plan to start classes in September of 2024, your marketing materials must be submitted to monthly magazines no later than June or July. Some period periodicals even combine June, July in one issue, so they may have an early May deadline. Newspaper press releases should be sent out six weeks before your launch date and repeated again two weeks before classes start or when your pre-event will be held and then followed up by phone or email one week prior to the start of class or your event. Radio and television stations are also a great source of using public service announcements or PSAs. Sign up sheets should be placed in conspicuous areas like the front desk, bulletin board, or a flyer stand. And these should be set out in your library at least six to eight weeks before the start of your class or pre-event. A pre-event could be a fall prevention presentation, a meet the instructor day, or a try before you buy, also known as class zero. I can't stress enough how important integral planning is to the success of a launch. The more you plan and follow that checklist, the higher your chances of getting people signed up. Most evidence-based programs include a license kit, which contains a marketing kit and sample press releases. We always suggest to use what has worked in the past and will mo most likely work again if replicated. Staff training is also another important thing that you need to do and make sure that your instructor finishes their training and certification at least one month before the class starts. This will give them proper preparation so that they're not nervous or trying to pull it together on the first day of class. All evidence-based programs use lesson plans to teach from, so your instructor never has to worry about making up a class routine or practicing a lot ahead of time. If using video-led classes, no instructor is needed, or maybe just to have a volunteer act as a supervisor or coach the group. Follow the instructions for playing the DVD for that day. Most libraries have high-speed internet, so DVD players may not be required when streaming or displayed licensed performance titles. Everything is always written down so that program fidelity is achieved. When programs are carried out 
as intended, program outcomes will be achieved, the same outcomes as were reported in published studies. Next slide, please. So our summary today is walking and doing Tai Chi is not, a, not enough to stay ahead of the aging time clock. And older adults should definitely be encouraged to lift weights two to three times a week, resistance training. Remember only 10% right now of older adults are exercising with weights, so we need to work on getting that number up. And physical activity, that E word exercise, is not something that should stop after a certain level is achieved. It is cumulative, so keep going. Next slide, please. So at this point, we're gonna to try to answer some of your questions. So um, if you're able to, Kara, if you can see what's in the queue, uh, or possibly I can, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to type in? Oh, uh, I can or see the chat now too. Your, yeah. Or you could just uh, stop your uh, mute and then ask them out loud. That would be fine too. Participants actually don't have the ability to do that. They'll have to use the chat. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so type, um, you know, in, either in the question and answers or the chat box. And I will give my email address at the end, just in case you don't have any questions now, but think of something later. Oh, that, that's a great question. Uh, what was the website to find articles on different evidence-based programs? Um, that would be ncoa.org, National Council on Aging.org. And uh, you'll scroll to the bottom of their homepage, and there's a link right there that says Find an Evidence Based Program. And they're all listed there. They have tons of different programs that you can choose from. Some are in English and Spanish. Um, they tell you about each one. And then you'll just click on the Read article next to each one to find out how they were developed and what's involved in getting the program offered at your library. Uh, one of the questions were, how do you determine what your seniors are interested in? I, I really am a strong believer in uh, polls. So if you have a sign-up sheet at the front desk and just say we're considering offering some disease prevention or health promotion programs here at the library, uh, what would you like to see interested? And you could maybe even list some so that they know what to choose, such as fall prevention, diabetes prevention classes, which are really starting to become quite popular since pretty much everybody in the United States is gonna be having diabetes type two pretty soon. Um, you know, these are all very important things that your library can get involved in. And, you know, the, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some seniors just have an aversion to going to a senior center. They just won't do it. They won't set foot in there. They have a stigma. But so many older adults go to libraries and they love them. They've been part of their community for years and years and years. And they, they feel very warm, safe, and welcome there. So... Uh, we've just found this one little niche market with well, with libraries that this, the programs have been very, very successful when they're offered in a meeting room like that. Um, does Jerry Fit have a list of material libraries should have to offer the program? Yeah, we, we actually do. On our website at jerryfit.com, uh, we have a licensing page, and then we have public performance licensing, which is what we do at libraries. That's for our video-led classes. However, if you have a community leader that would be interested in actually leading a class, that would be a facility license, which is a little bit different because she's going to be actually doing the training of the group. Um, but we also have the popular video led classes and it's very inexpensive to have your library become licensed to offer these programs. So we have a senior center that does not does not do these types of programs. However, they get very upset when the library tries to do these things for seniors. We have heard that. So you have to kind of establish these relationships with your 
senior center. And um, it, it's some, sometimes hard to break that barrier to reach out to them and suggest that we have a lot of interest here at our library. We're hoping to partner with you and maybe you could put out our flyers and maybe some of your seniors would like to come over and take our programs here at the library. But if they're not going to offer the programs and you have the clientele that wants the programs, um, maybe they'll have a different change of heart. Here's a, a question. Do libraries ever have trouble with their insurance carriers when planning to offer this type of program? Um, oh, you mean like your professional liability insurance? Well, you know, I've been in the fitness industry for 40 years having different fitness companies, Jerry Fit for the last 30, we have never, knock on wood, had anybody hurt themselves in this program or had anybody fall or had a lawsuit or anything like that. It's a very, very safe program. They do it mostly seated in chairs as this photo shows. So they're not, uh, they're not in a situation where they're losing their balance and it is a very, very safe and effective program. So I don't think that you would have a problem with that. Let me scroll back up to see if we have any others here um, that I haven't answered yet. Oh, here's another one. Um, do the libraries provide the weights or do participants so that they continue with the exercises after the program? Another very good question. Um, if you have the space and the budget, um, you might wanna provide the weights for the participants to use. However, I'm a teacher as well as the owner of Jerry Fit, and I always have my students bring their own weights to class. The reason for this is sometimes the two pound weights are only gonna be used for a short period of time. They get strong really fast and they're gonna need a set of three pound dumbbells. So, and they might interchange uh, by using the twos and the threes and they'll possibly even go to four pounds or five pound dumbbells if they stay involved in the program for at least a year. And usually five pounds is about it. They'll stay with that for a very, very long time, if not forever. So if you have the room and space and you want to, you can provide the weights. But again, this is a disinfection process too. If we get into a situation where we have another COVID situation, you're gonna have to disinfect those weights. Whereas if somebody brings their own weights to class, it's theirs to keep. They're their own weights, nobody else is touching them. I would suggest that people bring their own weights to class. That's how we've been doing it for a very, very, very long time. All right, let's see what else we have here. I'm just gonna start at the top because I keep losing my way down here. I see some of your libraries are offering some things for children. This is really great. One senior center or one library is offering a 50 plus DVD since 2008, 20, fabulous. Really good. Tai Chi, wonderful. Sorry, I'm just scrolling down because there are so many messages. Okay, <laughs> yoga and diabetes prevention from Charleston, South Carolina. That's great. Over one year now. There is a question about a staff member being certified in a chosen topic and where might they find the resources to do that? Could you repeat the question possibly again? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you ask a staff member to be certified in a chosen topic, where might they find the resources to do that? To get the training? Mm -hmm. I'm Is your question? That. I think yeah. so. What, each of the evidence-based programs have to have a training program for the class leader or the coach leader. Um, that's a requirement. They want to make sure that program fidelity is carried through. Um, this assures that the program is going to be taught as it was studied and reported on. 
and program fidelity is the, the major thing about these programs that they want people to follow. They don't want people to make up their own routine when they're teaching. Of course, modification and substitution is always allowed if a participant is unable to do a particular exercise for one reason or another. But for the most part, they want, uh, however the training is done, they want to carry it out so that it's taught the same. Okay, another question, does the licensing cost depend on the size of your library or the attendance, or is it a set amount? You know, um, every evidence-based program is structured differently. I, I know some of the other programs are based on population sizes, and that's how they determine the cost of the license. Others have a flat fee of what they charge for the license. And some of them have like blanket licenses or territorial. There's even statewide licenses for some of the evidence-based programs so that they're covering the entire state area. And, and again, these are all listed on that ncoa.org website at the very bottom, find an evidence-based program. And you might have to do a little bit of, spend a little bit of time to research all these, but and then uh, make contact with them because sometimes they don't have the actual costs listed on that, but you'd have to reach out to the individual evidence-based program and inquire. Okay, I'm just looking to see if we missed any questions. I think we have covered them all. Um, okay. I'm sorry if this was covered, but with regard to Title III funding, is that only accessible through a partnership with an ASAP or AAA? Again, um, you might want to, every state is so different. Um, there's no one size fits all. You'd have to contact your state unit on aging, your SUA, and just say, we're a library that has an older patrons that are interested in some of these evidence-based programs. We're wondering how we can get them offered. You know, make the, make the um, reach out to them and ask. Uh, you're not gonna know otherwise or send an email or, or some, some make communication in some different way. If if that if you get a dead end there, you can reach your county health department and see if they will share funding with your library. Most likely they will. We've seen a shift in the past two years that more and more libraries are getting this funding just because the senior centers are overbooked. You know, not only do they offer these exercise classes, but they have they serve lunch. They're having Scrabble games. They're doing activities, uh, vo you know, cheer, volleyball. They are packed and their rooms are in high demand. And sometimes they only have one room that's available. So they're seeking these alternative hosting sites to have these evidence-based programs. And I think if the contact was made, you'd be surprised that they're, you know, they, they may want to work uh, or, or uh, may want to work with you and even share their funding with you. I don't know how many other people uh, are like me, but this is the first time, I mean, whenever I found out about Jerry Fitz, that was the first time I even knew that kind of program existed. And so I think everything that you shared today has really helped, but a lot of the things that you shared were things I didn't know either. So how do we spread the word for the people that aren't on this webinar today? How do we get that information out there? Uh, well, you know, we do have a website. Um, if you actually want to go to the next slide, we have. Um, okay. Yeah, go to the next slide and we have the contact information there. Oh, okay. Oh, you know, these are just, I do want to mention that we had, I, I reached out to our, our libraries in Indiana, and I do want to mention a thank you to Amy Bastian, Bastian, uh, branch manager at Du Bois Branch Library, Kyle Evans at Owensville, Makala Sisson, who was our communications assistant at Fort Branch Library, and Laura Happy, director at Hopestat, 
Um, some of these libraries are still offering Jerry Fit, which we're really happy to see. It's been five years since we started there. And I know we've saved a lot of lives along the way and helped a lot of people. So we're, we're, we're very happy to see that they've continued. And that was part of our deal when we reached out to them before we started this study. We, we said, uh, if, if you'll do this study, we'll give you a perpetual license for life where you can offer Jerry Fit forever if you want. And um, it's nice to see that they're still offering it though too. And if you want to advance to the next slide, we're pretty much almost done. These are some of the studies that were uh, done on the Jerry Fit. These are the most recent ones. Um, they started in 2017. Uh, the one that we did with the libraries is on Web of Science. You do have to be a member of Web of, or a, have an account with Web of Science in order to access that. However, there's another very similar complete report that's available at let's, let's move in libraries.org. And um, if you search on Jerry, you'll see it right there. And of course, if you want to email me at the end, I'll be happy to share those links with you. And you can go to the next slide, Kara. I can send information out to Fran in the follow-up email uh, because I'll be uh, doing certificates for everyone that was able to attend today to earn library education unit credits. So if there's any other information like that we've, like what you just said that you wanna share, I can also share it in that email. Very good. Oh. Well, I enjoyed being your speaker today and I hoped everyone learned at least one thing new because I'm always a believer that if you spend a little time and you've learned one thing new, it's worth it. Yeah. So thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much for um, doing this with us. Uh, okay, so one asked, can I share the slides with them about the program? Is that allowed? Sure. Sure. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure we've got everyone. Yeah. Okay. You're getting lots of thank yous. Excellent program. You've shared such great information. I think I'm inspired to try to get involved um, either for myself because I, I told Fran recently that I had a fall. And so I feel like I'm starting to get that age where I do need uh, some strength training. So uh, yes, Anita, I am going to send out certificates to everyone who attended today. And I'll also send out a link to the webinar um, and then any other information that Fran shares with me that she wants you guys to have. Um, if you have questions, Fran is excellent. She's so passionate about this topic and she has been so great to work with. And so I, I wanna thank you, Fran, for everything you've done to, to bring this to us today. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Ginger said she's added this to my list of possible what I might get involved in after I retire. Well, I hear that a lot, actually. A lot of yeah. retirees become Jerry Fit instructors. Yeah. Well, it's a good it's a good match, I guess. Uh, I look forward to doing more research. We have an elderly patron who has trouble getting up from our tables at board game group, and maybe this will help. So, oh, yeah, it would definitely help them. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again, Fran. And I guess we will wrap it up today because I don't see any more questions uh, coming in. But like I said, if you do have questions after you, uh, you've left the webinar, Fran will answer or you can send them to me and I will share them with Fran. So, sounds good. Okay. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.